Well, good morning. Welcome back to Cross Community Church. We're glad that you're here, uh, especially those of you who are guests today, whether you're here or at Pecola or you're watching online. We're just grateful that you've chosen to worship with us today. Uh, today is and marks the end of our series where we've been walking through the five solas of the Protestant Reformation. Now, one of the things I haven't um, maybe been super clear on throughout this series is that every one of these solas, while they certainly marked a return to the faith of the scriptures, they mark a return to the Christianity of Christ, the faith of the apostles, the church that we see in Acts, they were also a response against a false teaching of the church in their day. When we say by scripture alone, um, when the, the reformers kind of Put this together, if you will. It wasn't all at one time. It, took a, it was a process to come together. But when the Reformers kind of brought forth the idea, Scripture alone, sola scriptura, it was sola scriptura, Scripture alone against putting Scripture on par with the traditions of men. When they said salvation by grace alone, it was a response to the false teaching of the church, which said um, it's salvation by God's grace plus your merit. When they said we're justified by faith alone, it was a response to the false teaching that says, no, 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 we're justified by faith and our works before God. Now, last week we talked about Christ alone as the mediator between God and men. That is a response to the false teaching that you need Jesus plus anything. In, in their case, it was Jesus plus the sacraments, Jesus plus the priest, Jesus plus the church in order to be in a relationship with God. God. Now today, the, the final soul, the one we're going to be talking about, is soli deo gloria. It means for the glory of God alone, or maybe more specifically, all glory belongs to God alone. And when you think about this, in the context of the other solas, we have a God who breathed out Scripture for us. Inspired of God, the inspired words of Scripture which reveal God to us plainly. We know who God is, how He works. We know how we are to relate to Him from the Scriptures. It was God who did that. We have God who in His grace alone chose to offer salvation to a world that had only sinned against Him. We are justified by faith alone in the work of Jesus Christ alone on our behalf. And so when you think about kind of this theological system here, God did all of the work. And so it only follows that God should receive all of the glory. Today we are going to talk about soli deo gloria, the glory of God alone. Now I'm not sure if you're familiar with this concept or not, um, but it's the idea of geocentrism. Uh, this idea was prominent actually about the time of the, the Protestant Reformation. This was a dominant view of looking at the world and in particular the universe. Geocentrism is just the idea that the earth is at the center of the universe. And as uh, astronomers and mathematicians, as they had studied our universe, this was the dominant view for hundreds of years, that the, the earth was at the center now, the problem with that was that it, with this view, the earth is at the center of the universe. Everything else kind of revolves around the earth. Um, there were a lot of unexplained phenomena. There were things that could be observed by the mathematicians, by astronomers, that could not be explained if the earth was at the center. But there was, there was a couple of things working against them in discovering the truth. All right, there were two uh, fundamental observations that kind of kept people anchored in what is known as geocentrism, the idea that the earth is at the center. The first is this. From the perspective of any observer, this is true of you and me too, from the perspective of any observer, the earth appears to be stationary. I mean, as we sit here today, we're not thinking, whoa, you know, this thing's moving. That's, that's not how we feel. It, it's solid, it's stable, and in our perspective, the earth is unmoving. So it, it only stands to reason that, well, everything else must be. Um, the second key observation was that once a day, the moon appears, the stars. We see uh, the, the planets that would come into view. Um, about once a day, the things that we see and experience would come into our, our view. And so, again, Earth must be stationary. We're seeing these things about once a day. They must be revolving around the Earth. Now, again, there were a lot of unexplained observations they couldn't put all the pieces together. And then just about the time of the Protestant Reformation, a new view 
was proposed. It was the view of heliocentrism, the view that rather than the earth being the center, um, the sun is the center of the universe, and the earth actually is in motion. We're spinning and orbiting all at the same time, and suddenly the, the science of astronomy began to explode because now the answers or the, the observations could be answered. They could explain the things that were ultimately being observed. Everything fell into place when they had the right thing at the center. Today, I want to say to you that I believe that just kind of such a revolution, if you will, this was known as the Copernican Revolution, just such a revolution needs to take place in our lives today. When we talk about the five souls of the Protestant Reformation, many times we, we speak of them like it's settled. Like, oh yeah, we've recovered these biblical truths, we, we're there, but can I just tell you that when it comes to soli deo gloria, the glory of God alone, this is one where I believe we have oftentimes, it's true in our lives, we still have the wrong thing at the center. And as a result, many of us live our Christian lives. We live our, our lives apart from Christ if you're not a believer. Uh, and they don't quite make sense because the wrong thing remains at the center. You see, here's what's happened for you. Since your earliest of days, everything you have ever experienced, the things you've seen, the things you've heard, the things you've felt, the things you've smelled, Thanksgiving dinner, we all experience through the lens of our self right? Like, you know, we taste those things, we smell, we, we interact with people, we experience them through the lens of self. So sometimes, rather than seeing God as the center of our lives, all glory belongs to Him, we were created by Him, for Him, and for His glory, sometimes we start thinking, no, 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 I'm at the center. I experience people, people interact with me, I, I judge events based upon how they affect my life, I, I tend to gravitate toward things that make me feel good, right, and I move away from things that cause me pain or make me feel bad. It is really easy for us to say, no, no, no I'm at the center. But if you're not there, maybe you're not uh, self-centered, if you will, maybe you're not that, uh, it's easy to allow other things to become the center of our lives, other pursuits, other things we might hope in to allow our jobs or our hobbies or our families or any other thing. When we allow it to become the center, suddenly our lives won't quite make sense. Now today, we're going to be looking at the Apostle Paul. He's coming into the city of Athens, and he is deeply disturbed because what he observed in the city of Athens was a group of people whose lives were profoundly off-center. They were doing a lot of good things with the wrong thing at the center, and so their lives weren't making sense. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 17. Just a few of the things that were going on here in this city. Verse 16, if you wanted to jump back and, and, and look at this, says, Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing a city full of idols. If you would have walked through Athens with Paul, you would have seen idols all over that city. Various names and shapes and sizes, but they were big on worshiping idols. They were obviously seeking after something. The second thing you would have observed, um, they were big into philosophy. There were the Epicurean and the Stoic philosophers, and basically uh, they spent a lot of time discussing ideas and trying to determine, like, what are we here for? What's the basis for our existence on this planet? Why were we created? What is the foundation of our existence? The third thing that Paul observed, we're going to see in verse 22, he says this to them. Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and he said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. So now nobody here is going to be like cheering on idol worship, um, but we would probably say you should worship. As a matter of fact, that is true for every one of us. We were created to worship something. Right? And, and we'll do that with our lives. You've probably seen it exhibited even in your own life. You want to pursue something, give your life to something. You want to seek meaning there. Now, Again, we wouldn't ever elevate the worship of idols, but these men are they're pursuing something, and so you can kind of give them a nod. This is not a terrible thing uh, to be pursuing something. Uh, the second thing they were doing is they were seeking to explain 
their existence. Why are we here? They were into philosophy, right? They were uh, trying to explain, like, uh, what is my basis for being on this earth? Third thing, they're pretty religious. Not in and of itself a bad thing, right? It says that Paul's spirit was being provoked within him as he walked through the city and he observed these things. And he explains why in verse 23. He said, I observe that you're religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. It says, therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. So there was a God in their city. I don't know if they lost his name tag. I don't know if over time it had become forgotten. You have lots and lots of various idols there they were worshiping. Um, but this inscription read, to an unknown God. Again, they kind of lost its name or something. So Paul, as he approaches these unbelievers in the city of Athens, worshiping other idols, seeking various philosophies, really religious and pursuing something, what he says about them is really important. He says, therefore, at the end of verse 23, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. This word for ignorant, you might recognize, it's, it's ag- agnoeo, which, where we get our modern word uh, agnostic. They were simply without knowledge. You have people that had idols everywhere. They, they wanted to worship something. They spent a lot of time in philosophy trying to explain the basis for their existence. They were doing all sorts of religious things. They wanted to worship. They wanted to offer themselves to something. They wanted to understand why they were there. The problem is that they were just ignorant. So Paul, he's stirred up. He's provoked as he sees this within the city. He says, what you have worshipped in ignorance, I am going to explain to you. Paul said, I'm going to tell you about the one true God. In verse 24, he says this, The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he does not dwell in temples made with hands. So, just in defining this unknown God that the people had not come to recognize or understand and telling us who God is, Paul points out um, that God is the creator of the universe. He created the earth, created the trees, the rocks, the things that we interact with on a day-to-day basis. He created us. And then he went beyond that. He created the sun and the moon and the stars. Like He created all of those things. He's a creator. Everything else is created, right? Paul's like, let me tell you who God is. He's he's bigger than that. He's greater than things that we can fully understand. He exists entirely outside of creation. He can't be constrained within temples made by human hands. He's not a God that you're going to fashion. He is a God who fashioned or created every other thing. Above every idol that was worshipped in the city of Athens, there is the one true God who created all of it. The wood that those idols idols were fashioned out of, the stone, the precious metals, God created all of those things. He was wholly uncreated. He was the creator. Paul continues telling us about who God is. Verse 25, Nor is he served by human hands. As though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath in all things. This might surprise you about God. He's not served by human hands. As though he needed anything. See, the God that that Paul was revealing here is entirely self-sufficient. He's not like sitting up in heaven hoping we'll get some things together that we can give him, you know, some sort of worship or praise. Or like God is not sitting in heaven waiting on us to serve him in any way. As a matter of fact, Paul points out, God has served us. 
He's the one that gave life and breath to every being on the earth. We don't sustain him. He sustains us. We didn't create him. He created us. He gives life and breath to all things. That breath you just took was a gift from God. Your body, your very existence, it's a, it's a gift from God. The things that you enjoy, the earth, the, the, the beauty of creation, all given to us by God. We don't supply any need of God's because he doesn't have need. But God supplies every need of ours, even our breath, our food, our housing. Everything that we have is a gift to us from God. He continues here. Verse 26 says, And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. Do you see what he's doing here? So God created everything, the earth, all that you see, he created the heavens, and God doesn't need us. Instead, God, he doesn't need us to give anything or to serve him, but God has served us. God has given to us. He has provided for us. He sustains us. He gives us breath. And beyond that, God has appointed um, the nations of the world, and, and specifically, he's appointed you to live in this nation at this specific time in this specific place. Paul is telling us about this unknown God to the Athenians, and honestly, I believe he's unknown to some of us. This God who is sovereign over every single detail of every single moment of all of creation. It's all by God. It's all for God. Romans 11.36 says this, For from him... And through him and to him are all things to him be the glory forever. Amen. What Paul is doing is he's saying, you know those, those idols that you carved out of wood? That you made with human hands? You know those gods that you're housing in, in temples that they're made by your hands? They're not very big. You made them. You built the temple for them. There's not much there. And then Paul tells us about a God that is far greater, far beyond all created things. Who created all things, the earth in which we live, the universe, the air that we breathe. He's given us life. He has appointed us to live in this nation at this time. To live specifically in this place. That he has ordained your life for you. He created you. The scriptures say he fashioned you together. He knit you together in your mother's womb. Your life and your breath. Every gift, every talent, every ability you've been given, even your weaknesses are given to you by the hand of our creator. He continues. And he tells us why. You want to know why you were created? You want to know that Copernican revolution of thought for you, where this shift in foundational assumptions will suddenly begin to make everything else fall into place and your life make sense? You want to know why God created the heavens and the earth and the plants and all the things that you enjoy? You want to know why he breathed life into you, gave you the gifts and the abilities you've been given, caused you to be born in the family that you were born into, the reason that God had you live in this place at this time? You want to know why that is? In verse 27, God has done all of this that they would seek God if perhaps they might grope for him and find him. You, just like the men of Athens, these were unbelievers. They were pursuing all sorts of idols and philosophies. They were pretty religious, but they didn't know who God was. And he's like, hey, you want to you tell you? You want to explain the questions that you've been seeking answers to? There is a God who's worthy of worship. He's greater than those idols. There is a philosophy worth 
following that is far better than the philosophies of men. And there is religious activity, if you will, that will have meaning to it. Paul is attempting to point them to the true center. And that is the one true God. He says, you were, in essence, you were created. That you would seek God and ultimately find Him. Our lives will never make sense when we put something else at the center some created thing, if it's our job, and we give ourselves to that job because we want to earn money or we want to achieve success or we want to gain status, when we give ourselves to that thing, our lives will not make sense. We'll be left empty and wanting. If you put yourself in the center and attempt to, to maybe explain all of your circumstances, if you live at the center of your world, there will be no room for you to understand suffering. There will be no room for you to understand anything but your own personal prosperity, right? It won't make sense. You'll probably be mad at God because you're the center and things are supposed to support and encourage you, right? When your child's success is at the center of your world, when your spouse is at the center of your world, when anything other than God is the center, if you will, if anything other than God gets your focus and your worship, your life will fail to make sense. But when you understand, as Paul has been helping the Athenian unbelievers understand, that God is the center of all things. He is above all things, all things created by him and through him and ultimately for his glory, that God is at the center and that your life was made to worship him, to glorify him. You were made to seek him and to find him, to know him and to serve him, to offer your life to him, that your gifts and abilities and your aptitudes and your money and all those things are actually given as gifts to you by God to use to bring him glory, then suddenly your life begins to make sense. You'll begin to view the world rightly. You'll begin to have that correct center in your life where you'll be able to understand the good times of God as extraordinary gifts from a creator and the difficult times that you may walk through as opportunities to bring him glory even in the midst of suffering. up against the teaching of the church that said, no, 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 um, yeah, sure, you glorify God, but you also need to revere the saints and the popes and, and hold these other people in high regard and, in a sense, glorify them. The reformers came out and said, no, 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 we exist for the glory of God alone. As a matter of fact, all glory belongs to God. Everything in all of God's creation was made to point back to God to his glory. As we look at the beauty around us, we should see the glory of God. The intricacy, the complexity of creation, we should see the glory of God. When we look at our fellow man, we should see men and women created in the image of God who were made to reflect God's glory. Can I just tell you that if you don't get this thing right, Religion is going to seem awfully strange to you. It's going to be a lot more like worshiping an idol. You know, you know how it worked with idols, right? There was an, an idol there, and you would offer it things, sacrifices and worship and praise or whatever, and you were doing that in exchange for some sort of blessing from the idol. Um, when we were in, in China, uh, this, this would happen with the people. They would go uh, into these ornate temples. And there were various stations, if you will, that were, that were put there in order to get the gods' attention or in order to gain their favor. And so uh, there was this massive pit. It looked like a, a big barbecue thing, if you will. And it was like made of metal. And it was made uh, to resonate sound. And so the people would go and they would light fireworks there and throw them in this metal thing. And it would be so loud. And that was, that was designed to wake the gods up. And then there was a place where you could burn incense in order to, to kind of appease the gods before you were to come into their presence. And then there was a place where we watched person after person, people who often didn't have much to offer. 
They would come bring sacrifices. They would like burn money and give food and all these things, all trying to appease the gods so that their lives would go well. When it's idolatry, it's I'm going to do this for you if you do this for me. That's, that's the relationship between us and really any other thing we would put in the place of God in this world. But we remember that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And God chose not to require a sacrifice from us, but to require a sacrifice or to provide a sacrifice for us in the person of Jesus. That God looked down upon us who were rebellious and separate from him. And he sent his son Jesus to the cross to make that atoning sacrifice for us. That we could have a relationship with him. And we see that this God who created us. That we might seek and ultimately find him. And and find in in him our our being to, to live these lives that would bring him glory. Like God is the one who has been drawing us. He created this for us. And now he's drawing us to this thing that would be our purpose. Look in verse 28. I'll go back to 27. He says, All of these things happen that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. You know, God is near. He's been pointing us back to him. You look at the Athenian believers or the, the Athenian men here in, in Athens, they were obviously seeking for something. They, they saw something in creation that says, There's something greater than me out there. So it was idols, and it was philosophy, and it was this religious activity that they were pursuing. Paul says, no, 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 God is is near. And he goes on, he says, for in him we live and move and exist. In him we live and move and have our being. Your soul will never be satisfied with anything in all creation. Your soul will only be satisfied in a relationship with your creator. See, he doesn't need anything from you, but you desperately need something from him. God is the God who created you and created the world and has given you all the things you've been given. He gives you your breath, every good gift you've given, and God is the one who ultimately sustains your being. It's in him we live and we move and we exist says, as even as some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. Now, in, in referencing children here, Paul's obviously talking to people who, who were without knowledge. They were ignorant, right? He says, like, you're agnostic. You don't know who God is. So when he t- calls them children, he's really referring to them as people who have been created by God. In verse 29, he says, being then the children of God, We ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art or thought of man. Paul says you you shouldn't confuse what should be at the center. The true God of this universe who created it all, who made you as you are, where you are, with the gifts that you have, the personality that you possess, See, he's not like something in creation. He's the one who created it. You don't shape God, he shapes you. You don't move God, he moves you. God is the one who is at the center of everything. It's in him we live and move and have our being, we exist. And as he points that out, He turns to one of those statements. It's time to bring it home for the men of Athens. Giving themselves to idols and philosophy and lots of religious activity. But it's time to bring it home for them that they might begin to walk in accordance with what they now knew. It says in verse 30, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance. Remember what what he called them on the front end? Back up in verse 23, he says, therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. He says, therefore, having overlooked your time of ignorance, God is now declaring to to men that all people everywhere should repent. 
This is the Greek word metanoia, which just means to change your mind or to change your direction. This is the invitation to the Copernican revolution for them. Hey guys, it's, it's time to put the rightful thing at the center. It's time for your life to begin living up to its purpose. It's time for your life to begin pointing not toward you and not toward your children or your bank account or any other thing, that you would stop serving all the other things. Instead, you would repent, you would change your mind, and you would put the proper thing at the center. And that is God. Having overlooked the times of ignorance, I would say this, he did it for the men of Athens. And God would do that for us, having overlooked our times of ignorance. But he would also say, it's now time for people everywhere to repent. To turn away from those silly idols that we've been giving ourselves to. And instead we turn to God. Because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed. Having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Paul's like, hey, if you're looking for where you should give your life, if you're looking for an authenticity or an, an authentic, or something to declare or make it authentic, a, a God that you can say, this God has power, he's real, he's genuine, he's like, I want you to look to the man. Jesus. Who endured a beating at the hand of the Romans was stretched out there on the cross. They drove the nails through his wrist and his ankle. And they thrust the spear into his side. And he died there. And they placed him in the grave for three days. And three days later, that man arose victorious over sin and death. He's like, if you're going to give your life to something, don't let it be stones. Don't let it be wooden objects that have been carved out or precious metals. Give your life to the one who overcame the grave. Give your life to the one true God. Put him at the center. The God who made everything that we know and see. Who created the earth, the sun, the moon, and the stars. The one who's given you life and breath from your first day of existence. One that wired you the way that you're wired, has given you the gifts that he's given to you, has seen fit that you grew up in the family that you grew up in. That you happen to be in eastern Oklahoma today. Repent. Put that God at the center. Allow your life to be a reflection of God's glory in creation. Quit serving the false things of this world and instead begin serving your creator. The Westminster Greater Catechism says it like this, Soli Deo Gloria. It says, the chief purpose of human life is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. See, sometimes we think of like serving God and giving Him glory. We have to give up all these great things. And yet what we know is that there is no greater path to joy and abundance than in surrendering ourselves fully to our great God. He's the one who's given to us. He's the one who created us. And it's in Him alone that we're going to live and move and have our being. It's in Him alone that we're going to find joy that will finally and fully satisfy our souls. Can I ask you a question today? What is that thing that you're hoping in? To see the worship of those men and women in China. There were these statues that looked almost silly to me. And they would offer money and food and tears because they hoped in a wooden statue. And while we might be tempted to kind of mock that or to think that is silly, we have our own idols in our lives. Can I ask you the question, what is that thing that you're hoping in? What is that thing that you're turning to? 
Is there a thing or maybe an idea or, or something in your mind that says, if I could just get that, if I could just achieve that level of financial success, if I could just achieve that level of fame, if I could just get that thing, that's an idol. And today the invitation is to repent of those idols, those things that we're pursuing, those things that ultimately get to call the shots in our lives. We repent of those things, and instead, we turn to the God of all creation, who alone deserves all glory and honor and praise. And when your life is lived fully for the glory of God, you will find what your heart has been longing for. You will find what the men of Athens were seeking through all of their religious activity and philosophy and pursuit of idols. You will find what they ultimately seek, that sought. You will find this unknown God to them who's been made known to us. This is a God who sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. So the invitation today to you is just to spend some time thinking and repenting. The band's going to come up and they're going to play. And we as the body of Christ, we as Cross Community Church are going to think about our lives. What are the things that we're giving ourselves to? What are the things that we're hoping in? We're going to do just what Paul call, called the men of Athens to do, to repent. And instead to turn to Jesus Christ, God alone, who's worthy of all glory and honor and praise. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you've given us breath. You've given us life. You've given us our gifts and our skills and our abilities. You've given us our financial provision. You've given us the houses that we live in, this world that we inhabit. And God, we realize that all that is given ultimately for you and for your glory. So I pray that we as a church would be quick to repent to turn away from the things that we might pursue to satisfy us or to hope in. And instead, we would hope in you alone. God, that in you alone, our hearts would be satisfied. That in you alone, we would find fullness of joy. God, we can't do this on our own. And so today, we invite you to lead us to repentance. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.